3. Turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 3. It's in the New Testament. Not far from the back of the Bible. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Philippians chapter 3. I believe I'll be brief this morning. I don't believe I'll be long. But you never know how that goes. Chapter 3, verse 10. Don't believe I'll be very humorous either. I know most, most weeks we have a lot and we laugh and laugh and laugh, but I don't believe I will be today. I believe I'll be direct and right to the point. Verse 10, chapter 3. That I may know him, this is the Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and then here's the text. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In verse 13, I want to call your attention to that, where Paul said, This one thing I do. What's the one thing he did? He forgot those things which are behind. Why? Why did he forget? That enabled him to reach forth unto those things which are before. Paul did one thing. He reached forth. How did he do that? He forgot those things which are behind. And I want to preach this morning in just a minute after our special on say goodbye, say goodbye, and don't look back. Say goodbye, and don't look back. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. I'll never grow tired of saying I love you. I, I believe with all my heart the Bible's true. If I didn't believe it, I might as well just uh, go stick it on a bookshelf and just go out and build me some hot rods and work, make as much money as I can and just have a lot of fun every weekend. That's what I ought to do if I didn't believe this book was true. But, Lord, I do believe it's true. And I don't just believe it's true. I know it's true. I don't give a stinking rip what the scholars say. I don't care what the scientists say. I don't care what the theologians say. I just happen to believe the book's true. Lord, since it is true, now, Holy Spirit, I believe that without you, I can't do anything. Without you and without love in my heart, I'm just going to get up here and just spout off a bunch of words. And it doesn't matter how well they're presented, Father, if the Holy Spirit doesn't get in it, then, then it'll just be tinkling brass and sounding cymbal. It'll be worth nothing. So, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come now. Come in power. Lord, bless this message, Lord, from my heart, from your heart to my heart, to these precious people's hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't have to look at it or turn back to it, but I, I like that where Paul said, this one thing I do. Uh, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable. <clears throat> Paul said, I need to have one thing, one goal, one purpose, one uh, reason for what I'm doing. He said, this one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind me, and I reach forth unto those things which are before me. And I think by titling it, say goodbye and don't look back. In just a few minutes, you'll see why I said that. Now, Paul is writing this letter in the book of uh, Philippians. is a letter to the Philippian church. He wrote a letter. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was writing a letter. He wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus and the church at Galatia, the church at Rome. He wrote one to his preacher boy named Titus, and he wrote one to his preacher boy named Timothy. And he, he writes a letter, just like you'd sit down and write a letter to a friend of yours or you'd write a letter to a relative. He writes a letter, and he writes this letter from a Roman jail cell. <clears throat> he fully realizes that very soon he's going to face the executioner's blade, and after that he'll immediately be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. He won't go in the grave and wait a resurrection. He won't just die and have soul sleep. He's not just going to die and lay there and never get up again. No, the Bible says to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And uh, the Apostle Paul knew that. But before he goes, he wants to leave some advice for this church as to how they can keep going forward until the day of their departure. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, I want everybody to keep going. I don't want anybody to quit. I don't want anybody to stop. I want everybody to keep going. And he tells them how to do it in chapter 3. He says, uh, forget the things from your past that would stop you. Paul says, that which would hinder you, forget it. He says, that which would discourage you, it's all right. If, if he fusses too much, I have an office. You can just go right back in the office, or you can take him in the nursery. Either, either thing you want to do. If you, if you feel uncomfortable with him, you can just take him in the office, or you can uh, take him back here in the nursery. So Paul says, that which would hinder you, forget it. 
That which would discourage you, forget it. Whatever it is that will discourage you, Brother Gary, forget it. This is what Paul says. He says this to the Philippian church. He says, that which would make a coward of you, forget it. That, would, that which would cause you to turn aside, that which would cause you to quit, forget it. Paul said, forget the things in your past that would make you want to quit. Let me get that. And, I mean, a baby cries. That's what to be expected. And sometimes wives, they cry too. But I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know anything about that. If any, if anybody knew how it how it felt to want to quit, I believe the Apostle Paul knew what he felt to want to quit, what it felt like. And Paul said, "I've got to forget the things that make me want to give up, and I've got to forget the things that make me want to quit." The Apostle Paul, if you know anything about the, well, I won't say it like that. Like you don't know anything if you don't know what I'm getting ready to say. But uh, the Apostle Paul, if you, if you do know anything about the Bible, if you don't, that's that's okay. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, had started out as a high rising, high ranking, fast stepping, ladder climbing Jew in the Jewish religion. He didn't start out as a Christian. He didn't grow up in a Sunday school. Amen. He grew up living in the street somewhere. And Paul grew up in the Jewish religion. He was a high ranking Jewish official. He was a member of the Sanhedrin court. If you think about this, nowhere in the writings of the Apostle Paul did he ever one time mention mother father, brothers, sisters, wife, sons, daughters. Nowhere. Nowhere. You know why that is? Because Paul's family had forsaken him and told him, when you quit Judea, Judea, Ju when you quit being Jewish, amen, uh, Judaism, and you go to Christianity and follow after this so-called resurrected Christ, we turn our backs on you. That's it. You're out of our family. You're out of the will. We don't know you anymore. Don't even come. You come around our house, we'll throw stones at you like we would at any dog. That's what they told Hyman Appleman. Uh, that's what his father told Hyman Appleman. He was a Jewish fellow that got saved and, and went to be an a evangelist. And his father told him, when you crawl back to me with your sides stuck together, I'll throw you a crust of bread like I would any dog. His whole father, his, his own father told him that. And Paul knew about that. He had risen high and his family forsake him. Paul had bloody hands. He had killed men. He would killed women. He would killed children. He would cast them into jail all for the sake of his religion. And now who he once had persecuted, he now served. And Paul said, I can't look back. If I lay awake in my at bed at night and I think about my wife and kids, I think about my, my daddy, turn, I think about my dad hating me now, turning his back on me, my dad going to hell, he said, I can't think about those things. So Paul writes this epistle and says, if you want to finish what you started, say goodbye and don't look back. Say goodbye and don't look back. I'll tell you what, you know what we need in America? We need folks that will finish. I've got some guys that work for me. i got six, seven, eight guys, and they, they work for me. Actually, about all of them, about four of them work, and the other four draw a paycheck. And I've got to stay on them and stay on them and stay on them and stay on them and stay on them. Did you scrape the floors after you got through taping the job? Did you scrape them? Oh, I didn't have a scraper. I've got some Spanish guys that work for me. We didn't have a broom, I told a guy one time. It's not too recently either. He knows he's supposed to scrape up all the mud that gets dropped when they run the mud and finish the angles, and all the mud that falls on the floor, and they sand it, and there's dust everywhere. I said, oh, you don't have a scraper? He said, no, his name's Javier. I said, Javier, no scraper, no check. Hey, I think I saw one in the basement. <laughs> I, 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 he goes down the basement. Folks, the only people that keep scrapers are maybe, I don't know. I don't know what other, com what other type. Painters don't have them. Uh, brickies don't use them. Siding guys don't use them. Uh, the rockers, the hangers, we don't use them. Finishers have them. And he went down there, and there just happened to be a scraper with drywall mud on it and a broom with dust on it. Wonder how that got there, Javier. Yeah, I said, Javier, no scrape, no check. I think there's one in the basement. He went down there, and he came right up with one, amen. I said, yeah, Javier, I thought you might come up. I said, Javier, I don't care if you use a six-inch knife. I don't care what you use. Get the floor cleaned up. And Javier managed to do that, amen. Because he wanted to check. We need folk. We need folk that will finish the job. Amen. We need folk to put Christ first all their days of their life. A lot of people start not finish. A lot of people will get fired up. Man, I'm saved. Oh, boy, bless God, I'm going to heaven. I'm fired up. But they don't finish. A lot of people start. They don't finish. You don't go to many church where you see a 55 or 60-year-old guy preaching all enthusiastic like I do. Amen. Because a lot of young guys, like, I hope when I'm 60, I'm still kicking his eyes when I'm 30. I hope when I'm 65, I'm still preaching hard like I am when I'm 35, amen? That's what I plan on doing. That's what I want to do. And we need people that will finish what they start, amen? Now, a lot of people start, but few, few finish. Now, how do you finish? How do you finish? You say goodbye and don't look back. Now, personally, I like to look back. I, I like looking back. I like old times. 
I like history. I like old-fashioned things. In fact, I was at Miss Culberson's house yesterday. Uh, honey, you, you need to go see Miss Culberson's house so you can start to covet, you know. Uh, we looked at her house. She's got beautiful old-fashioned things, and she's got the hardwood like we do, and just beautiful old-fashioned stuff. And Brother Eddie was talking about church, and I was more interested in the old pictures and the old clocks and the old furniture in it. Uh, we have a lot of old furniture, too, but it's not antique furniture. It's just old beat-up <laughs> Hand me down goodwill stuff, uh, but I, I like old things. And if I don't watch myself, I'll, I'll find myself living in the used to. Oh, we used to do this. We used to do that. It's easy for my mind to go back to the past all the time and think about it. And I'm not talking about going back to the past where I used to sin and go back. Well, I still do sin, but I mean going back where I used to live and dwell in sin. And that's what my world revolved around: my self pleasure. The Bible says, no, 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 gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sin is gone. Now, thank God I like that song. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. There's been a great change in my life since I've been born again. I don't go back and dwell on the things I used to do. But I can't live in the past. Uh, my wife lives in the present. <clears throat> this church is in the present. My kids live in the present. And they need me to live in the present, the today life. I've had to learn some things about life. I've had to learn that life changes. Uh, for instance, this pretty soon will be in a season of change. Most families move in the summertime. <clears throat> uh, graduation comes at the end of spring. Many uh, marriages happen in the summertime, in the springtime. Uh, vacations are usually taken in the summertime. And life changes. But there are some times in your life when you have to go back and look at something in your life and go back and open the door and look at that incident in your life or look at that problem in your life or look at that situation in your life, look at it, learn what you can from it, and then shut the door on it, walk away, say goodbye, lock the door, and don't look back. You can't keep Paul, the Apostle Paul, couldn't keep going back and open the door and saying, boy, I used to kill people. I used to blaspheme Jesus. I used to murder Christians. He couldn't oh, every day open the door and say, my wife and kids and mom and dad, they all left me. They abandoned me because I went. He said, forgetting those things which are past and looking forward to those things which are before, this one thing I do. Now, let me give you a few things, a few times when to say goodbye and not look back. Number one, when you made a mistake. Now, when you've made a mistake in your life, you need to say goodbye and don't look back. You say, well, preacher, you just don't know what I've done. I've done some bad things in my life. You need to say goodbye and don't look back. You say, preacher, I, I've got a jail record. I've been arrested. Well, join the crowd. Probably half the people in here have got a jail record. Amen? I know my wife. She's been arrested many times. No. Bad spousal abuse. That's what would be. I had a good sermon going, so I threw that humor in there. Uh, when you make a mistake, when you make a mistake, say goodbye and don't look back. Maybe you used to be a drunkard. Well, say goodbye and don't look back on it. Maybe you used to be a thief. Say goodbye and don't look back on it. Maybe you used to use drugs all the time. Well, say goodbye and don't look back on it. Say, preacher, you don't know what I, I've got. A god awful temper. I've lost my temper so many times. I've been fired from jobs. I've beaten people up. I've hit my wife. I've cursed my father, my mother. You don't know what I've done. Okay, you've sinned. Now say goodbye. Look at it. Learn from it. Quit doing it. Say goodbye and don't look back. You say, preacher, but I, but I, I fathered kids and ran off and left them. Well, you need to pay the child support and do what you can about it. But you need to say goodbye and don't don't do it again. But you need to put that thing behind you and live your life for the future. You say, preacher, I, I I've been divorced. Okay, look, folks, there's people in here that have been divorced, aren't there? But you didn't try and get divorced, did you? You didn't make it a point. When I got married, I wanted to get divorced. You didn't say that, did you? You didn't say, boy, when I get married, that's, that's my goal someday. It happened to you. You made the mistake. It happened. Now look at it. Learn from it. Say goodbye and don't look back at it. No sense in you looking back on your life all the time and saying, I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. Okay, you're going to blow it all the time. But if you're, if you're walking backwards looking at it, you're, gonna run, you're not seeing what's ahead of you. You're going to run into something. You're going to blow it again. So say goodbye and don't look back when you've made a mistake. We all make mistakes. We all sin. We all fail. Failure plus failure plus failure plus failure equals a human life. Amen. Failure plus failure plus failure. Nobody in here can say I'm perfect. Nobody can in here say I never failed. Nobody in here can say I never made a mistake. Nobody in here can say I never sinned. You've all sinned. I've sinned. You've sinned. You've failed. I've failed. You've made mistakes. I've made mistakes. Now look at it. Learn from it. And shut the door on it. Walk away from it and say I'm not going to let that mistake dominate my future. Say goodbye and don't look back. I'll tell you another time to say, say goodbye and don't look back. When a loved one dies, they say, boy, preacher, you're not talking about just forget about our loved one. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you have guilt over a loved one dying. When my dad passed away, I had so much guilt about it. He died in 1979 of a heart attack when he was 51. At the time, I was living on 1401 Alabama Street, uh, living in uh, just a um, very degraded lifestyle. Life was just... Uh, 
in excess. Everything I did was in excess, excess, excess. Uh, the whole, the whole thing. When my dad passed away, I knew my dad loved me, and I knew my dad wanted to be proud of me. But I never gave dad much of a chance to be proud of me. And when dad passed away, I felt guilt for a long time over it. And one day, I just had to finally realize I can't feel guilty about my past anymore. I asked God to forgive me, and I went on from there. Now, if you've had a loved one die and you feel guilt about it, you can't change it. You can't go back and change it. I know so many people whose a loved one has passed away, and they carry that guilt, and they carry that burden, and they carry that pain with them day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Why? Why keep carrying the guilt? You can't, and all you do, you'll talk about it, and you'll think about it. What you're doing is you're poisoning those around you in your present, the ones that need you in your present, and you keep living in the past and dragging that past chained up and bound up, and you keep bringing that past with you and bringing that past with you, and you're just hurting the people in the present. Now say goodbye, and don't look back. That's what's wrong with people who grieve excessively. 20 years later, they're still grieving and grieving and grieving and grieving and grieving. Why? Because they can't say goodbye and not look back. Folks, I can't spend my life in sadness and defeat. I've got a family. I've got a church. I've got a wife. I can't live my life in defeat about what I did in the past. The past is gone, amen. The past will never be recaptured. Uh, April of 1994 will never be back. April of 1993 will never be back. It, they're, they're not coming back. The Bible says God knows the way through the wilderness, amen. Now, God knows the way through the hard times in your life. Whatever your failures are, whatever your mistakes are, say goodbye and don't look back. Another time to say goodbye and not look back is when you have a heartache. Everybody gets heartaches. Everybody has disappointments. Tears come to everyone's eyes. It's a, you know, there's not an adult in this room that couldn't, couldn't take a five minutes to start writing and not stop about heartaches in their life. Broken marriages, wayward children, estranged relationships with your folks or brothers or sisters, jobs maybe you got fired from, financial, stupid things you've done financially to put yourself in a hole, uh, th times you've hurt people's feelings, all kinds of heartaches. There's not an adult in this room, and teenagers, if you don't have any, they're coming on. And I know teenagers, they have them too. But there's not an adult in this room that doesn't have a heartache, not one. doesn't matter what your face says, in here there's a heartache. Everybody gets them. Everybody, oh, I don't cry, I'm a man. Well, I cry, and I'm as tough as anybody in here. Tears come to everybody's eyes at one time or another. Everybody's heartache is different. Your dreams may be shattered. You may have lost confidence in people, but the song says, just turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Amen? Turn your eyes on Jesus when you've got a heartache. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Don't Jesus never fails. Amen? He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Yeah, people may fail you. Foes may assail you. Friends may turn from you, but Jesus never faileth. And when you have a heartache, say goodbye and don't look back. Let me tell you somebody else to say, say goodbye and don't look back to. The old crowd, amen? Yeah, but say goodbye to the old crowd. I got an old crowd and I got a new crowd. The new crowd reads the Bible, amen? The new crowd prays. The new crowd goes to church. The new crowd, and not all of them do though, but the new crowd want to and the new crowd need a preacher, amen? The old crowd, those days are over. High school days are over, Doug Jackson, they're over. The Navy days, praise God, are over, amen, they're over. Hiles Anderson College, I thought I'd be glad when they were over, and I was right, I was right. I used to sit there with guys and say, oh, I wish I was back in college. Well, you're, you're some kind of fool then, because I'm, I'm glad they're over. No more tests. No, actually, I'm, going, I'm having a test right now. This is my test, and God's grading me. I hope he's giving me a good grade, amen. Uh, the Hiles Anderson College days are over. Uh, living in Chico and working in Chico, California, those days are over. Say goodbye to the old crowd and don't look back. If you've been born again, if you have Christ in your heart, say goodbye to the old crowd that would turn you away and turn you aside from what's right and that would hinder you and that would slow you down and make you want to quit. Turn your back on them. Say goodbye and don't look back. Now, I'm not saying don't try and go back to the old crowd and get them saved and bring them into church. But I'm saying turn your back on that stuff. Say goodbye and don't look back. Another time to say goodbye and don't look back is personal disappointment. When my family moved in July of 1990 and we moved to Chico, California, I thought I'd stay there forever. I, I literally, I went out and told the preacher, I'm here forever. I'm not moving. I'm not going anywhere. We're here forever. I thought I'd grow old there. I thought I'd rear my family there, didn't we, honey? I mean, we went there to stay. That we, in fact, we go everywhere to stay. 
We went to school to stay until I graduated, and I stayed till we graduated. I went to Navy to stay, and they unfortunately they kicked me out, man. But uh, no, they didn't. They were glad when I left, though. But uh, I thought uh, I'd grow old in California. We came to Fort Wayne to stay, and we're going to stay in Fort Wayne. And whatever, whatever I do, I want to do it to stay. And we went to Chico. I thought I was going to stay, but we didn't stay, and we're not going to stay, and it's not going to happen. And I'm not going to look back on it and say, well, boy, we could, if we just stayed in Chico right now, we'd be making $30,000 a year, and we'd have a, a $150,000 home. And where we lived out, we lived in one place. You'd walk out the back door. You could see the coastal mountains. I mean, beautiful mountains all along the coast. And, uh, and you were like, almost like you could reach out and touch them. They were only about 40 miles away. And then if you walked around the other side of the house, you could look up and see snow-capped mountains. What was that, Mount Lassen? A 14,000-foot snow cap. I mean, it could be the hottest it could be 110 degrees in the valley and you could look up there and see a snow-capped mountain i mean mountains here and mountains here just beautiful you could be in 110 degrees and get in your car and drive 20 miles up up the up the uh, uh, uh the mountain and be in snow amen up in i can't think of the name of the town right now but it's where the hops of in paradise yeah paradise and uh, you could drive. We lived in a beautiful, beautiful. So we could go to a place and stand on these bluffs and watch dozens of eagles just swooping and so on. I mean, just stand there and watch them all. We lived in a beautiful place, and I mean, a beautiful God's God's beautiful place of God's creation. And I thought we would stay there. I thought we'd lay in bed at night and hear uh, uh, coyotes. I mean, right outside, we just hear coyotes right outside the door. Just, just I don't know how close they were, but they they seemed like they were right outside the door. Fruit trees all around us. The guy was uh, there were orchards all around. Just a beautiful area. And when we moved there, I thought. Boy, we went there to stay, and that's where we're going to stay. And then uh, things turned around, and it broke our heart when we left. But it was a personal disappointment. I remember it was uh, 1993 years ago, in 1992, in April. I remember driving back across California, driving through California, and driving across Utah and every place else you got to go through to get back to Indiana, and driving in that big old truck and thinking, what in the world am I doing? Everything I had was in that truck. My wife and daughters, they were in a van, and, and we were racing back across the country, too. And she took one way, and I took the other, and I won, though, amen? And, um, but she had to stop and sleep, and I don't blame her for that. But uh, I had a spare driver. That's what it was. I had David. But we drove and drove and drove, and I thought, what am I doing? And my heart was breaking. I thought I was making the mistake of my life. And for a while, I was so disappointed in my own judgment. But as it turned out, God's hand was in control the whole time. And I had prayed and prayed and prayed. I'm not going to go into it, but I, I had, there were so many scriptural reasons that I had to. I couldn't stay there. There were plenty of reasons, and I knew there were, but I didn't trust myself. And it was a personal disappointment. But I got out, and I, for a while, I looked back. And I kept looking back and saying, "What if? What if? What if?" And eventually, I had to go and look at that, open that door. And you had, you saw Brother Rule here the other day. And I looked in that door, and I looked at everything in my relationship and everything in that church out there. And I looked at it. I said, "Everything I can learn, I'm going to learn from that." And then I shut the door and said, say goodbye and don't look back. I don't ever say to my wife anymore, boy, what if we were still in Chico? Never. I don't ever say it. Haven't been saying it now for about a year. Haven't said it one time. I believe that's one reason God's blessing us. Because God knows a man puts his hand to his plow and doesn't look back. He's fit for the kingdom of God, amen. And my plow's on the hand in Fort Wayne. Not any place else, Fort Wayne. Now, Now, what's your personal disappointment? What is it that's broken you up? What is it? Say goodbye. Go, go back to it. Open the door to it. Look around at it. Death of a loved one? Heartbreak? Disappointment? What is it? Look around. Learn everything you can from it. And lock that door. Shut it. And don't look back. Don't look back on it. Because all it'll do is hinder you. The song says, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Pressing on the upward way. Gaining new heights Every day. Any personal disappointment you have, say goodbye and don't look back. And the last time to say goodbye and don't look back is when you have disappointment in people. Folks, did you know that people fail? Did you know that people lie? Did you know that people quit? Do you know that people will tell you one thing to your face and not do it? Do you know people will say one thing to you and do exactly the opposite behind your back? Do you know somebody will tell you, oh, you're the best preacher in the world, and five minutes later, talk to somebody, their wife or husband or friend, and say, man, why does that guy always do so-and-so? And And there's no doubt in my mind, but to all the people in this congregation right now, that some of you say stuff like that about me. Now, wait a minute. doesn't bother me, though. You know why? Because I've learned not to get disappointed in people. You know why? Because God doesn't get disappointed in me. Because if God got disappointed in me, we'd be in a heap of trouble because he'd have a whole lot to be disappointed about. 
so I don't get disappointed in people. If somebody leaves the uh, PA on all night, week after week after week after week, I don't get disappointed. If, if, if I go out here and leave the, the smart, listen to this. I had my car worked on last week. Two CV joints, bunch of front end work, cost me a thousand, almost eleven hundred dollars. I've only had it two weeks. I turn around, go to pull out, axle brakes this morning. Now I could be real disappointed in the guy that worked on my car, but I'm not. I'm not disappointed. I can't control it. Angels stirring the waters, amen. People felt, listen to this statement. You're never, you'll never successfully work with people until you master the art of forgiveness. You always at your wife's throat. Get off her back, jerk face. You, you, you always, you always, you always on your husband, wife. You probably have a good reason for that. <laughs> You're never going to successfully work with people until you master the art of forgiveness, and it is an art. It's not easy just to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. But if you want to be like God in heaven, you better forgive people. And you better learn that thing of forgiveness. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Peter came to Jesus and said, How many times should I forgive my brother if he offends me? Seven times? Jesus said, No, 70 times 70. He said, Basically, what he's saying is there is no cutoff point. How many times can you sin and go to God and get forgiven? Every time you sin. God is forgiving. And there's times in your life where you've got to say goodbye and don't look back. Say goodbye and don't look back. When you fail, man, shut the door and lock it and walk away and say, I can't dwell on failure. If you've blown it and blown it and blown it and blown it, man, shut the door and take April 9th, 1995, and say from this day forward, like Paul, I'm going to forget those things which are past, and I'm going to press on for those things which are before, and I'll build a life starting April 9th, 1995. I'm not saying forget about your mom and forget about your dad and forget about your grandmother, and mine are all in heaven, and I'm not saying forget about the times you failed and forget about the times you blew it. I'm not saying forget, just, just forget and act like it didn't happen, but I'm saying go back to it, look at it, Examine it, see what you can learn from it, get get the good things out of it, hug those the good memories and those things to your heart, and then shut the door on it and walk away and don't look back. All the memories of my mom and dad are good. All of them. I have no bad memories. Even my when my dad would whop on me and stomp on me and all kinds of stuff would happen, I look back and think, hey, my dad was all right. My dad was a great man. I love my dad. I'm proud of my dad. I can't wait to see my dad in heaven. I'm proud of my mama. I can't wait to see my mama. But why isn't my sister and my other brother and my other brother and my other sister, all they remember my mom and dad are bad memories? Why is it that when I get together with my sister, oh, do you remember the time dad did that? No, I don't remember that. Do you remember the time mom did that? I don't remember that. But do you remember the time mom did a good thing for us? Do you remember the time dad did something good for us? I don't want to remember the bad things. I don't. That doesn't help me any. I got a life to live and kids to raise and a church to pastor. And I want to look at those things and say, I already shut the door on them, sister. I already shut the door on them, brother. I looked at it. I learned from it. I forgave my parents for the things they did when I was growing up. Yeah, they messed, you know, they did a bunch of crazy stuff, and we grew up messed up. But I looked at it, and you know what? You know why Doug's a pastor, and Cindy's not? Well, Cindy better not be a pastor. Well, unless she's charismatic. But you know why? You know why uh, uh, Doug? You know why Doug loves God and tries to live by a book? And you know why one brother's in prison, the other brother just got out of prison, and the other brother's on his way to stinking prison, and one sister's got four uh, 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 illegitimate kids, and the other sister's all warped up in her mind and the other brother he who knows where he is and what he's doing you know why because every one of them keep opening the door and looking back at their past and looking back at mom and dad and looking back at how we were raised and pointing at it and looking at it and getting mad about it and uh, examining it all the time and i looked at it opened the door and said what can i learn from it learned everything i could from it forgave mom and dad for what they did to me and not that i can remember anything they did to me for and shut the door and locked it walked away that's it and all i took with me good memories all i took with me were blessings that's it. Yeah, we had 18 Christmases together, and 15 of them, Mom and Dad, got knocked down, drag out brawls. Yeah, yeah. But I remember the three they didn't. Amen. Yeah, we had birthday parties where people got mad and threw cakes across the room. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, I remember my dad coming in and just just lose, just going ballistic and taking a belt and whipping anything that moved, and whoever didn't get out of his way got it and got it and got it and got it until you got under a bed or out a window and then you didn't dare come back for a while. I mean, you know, you didn't dare come home until Dad left. And then you knew he'd be gone for a couple of days, and he'd be different by the time he got You hope he'd be different by the time he got home. Yeah, I remember those things happening. But, but I, choose not to, I choose not to think about them. I choose to remember Dad coming home with a Cub Scout. You know, I remember one time I was playing ball across the street, and Mom had told me not to go across the street. 
PS 54, public school 54. Dad's mom said, don't go across the street. And I disobeyed mom and went across the street. And dad came home. Dad said, Doug. I said, I mean, you could hear that voice like two miles away. Doug. I said, oh, no. He said, get over here right now. I said, oh, it was like, you know, the lat. you see them drag these guys, the electric chair, you know. And I went across the street and he came in. He said, sit down on the couch. I thought I, I couldn't even, you know, my mind was just, you know, going spasmodic. I couldn't imagine what would happen. But fortunately, my dad was in a good mood that day. And he pulled, he, he went in another room, brought out a Cub Scout uniform for me when I was about seven years old. Now, that's what I'm going to remember about my dad. I'm not going to remember all that other stuff. And you know what? You can be the same way. You don't have to remember your bad things of your past. Go to them today and say, past, look your past in the eyes. And say, past, you will not dominate my future. Past, you will not cause the pain of the past is not going. I'm not going to permit you to cause pain in the future. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to examine it. I'm going to learn everything I can from it. I'm going to take the good from it and leave the bad. I'm going to shut the door, and I'm going to say goodbye, and I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to take the good with me. That's how you have a successful life. That's how you prosper. That's how you don't live in misery and pain your whole life. Say goodbye, and don't look back. Let's bow our head and close our eyes, please. Say goodbye, and don't look back. Every one of us... Well, every one of us in here have kind of things in our life we have to say goodbye and not look back on. I do. Boy, I sure do. So many times I've messed up. So many times I've failed, not done what I should, and I have to say goodbye. Say, I'm not going to let the past meddle with the future. But one of the most important times I had to say goodbye and not look back was on how to get to heaven for sure. The old way was be good. The old way was keep the rules. The old way was have more good deeds than bad deeds, and when we get to heaven, God will put them all on a big scale, and if the good deeds are better than the bad deeds, then I get to go to heaven. But that's the old thing that I had to look at and say, this is no good. The new thing is that Jesus died for my sins, that Jesus Christ was a pure Lamb of God, sinless, without sin, came to earth, born of a virgin, lived 33 sinless years, died on a cross, beaten beyond recognition with Roman fists and a cat of nine tails, hung on a tree, stripped naked, hung on a tree to die. Why? He never sinned. Why? To pay for our sin. After three days in the tomb, he was resurrected. Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. The fact God brought him to life shows that God took his sin. This took his death as a sin payment. And that's how you go to heaven. Not because you're good, but because you trust Christ and get your sins forgiven. When you stand before God, God's not going to say, were you good? God's going to say, did you get your sins forgiven? Did you get your sins forgiven? You don't get your sins forgiven by going to, coming to me as a pastor and confessing them. You don't get your sins forgiven by going to a confessional booth. You don't get your sins forgiven by joining a monk and being a, uh, a monk. You get your sins forgiven by going to Jesus, who already paid the sin debt, asking him to be your Savior. And I'll just a minute, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to say, if you're here today and you've never done that, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in your seat in just a minute. If you've never asked Christ to save you, if you're not 100% sure you're going to heaven today, it's not a, ma a matter of joining this church. It's not a matter of being baptized. It's not a matter of, of reading your Bible every day or wearing a suit or getting a haircut. It's just a matter of getting your sins forgiven. That's what will take you to heaven when you die. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I am 100% sure. I'm 100% sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I have no doubt about that. Would you raise your hand? Let me see it. Good. 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 You can slip your hands back down. Good. All right. Some of you are honest, honest men, honest women, honest teenagers. You're able to say, no, I'm not sure. Say, Brother Jackson, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I am not 100% sure. But if it's as easy as you say it is, and I can know for sure I'm going to heaven when I walk out of here just by asking Christ to save me, if it's that easy, Brother Jackson, I'd like to do that. If I could sit right here in my chair and I could ask Christ to save me, yeah, I'd like to do that. Is that you? You say, Brother Jackson, yeah, I want to know for sure I can go to heaven. Is that you? Would you slip your hand up and let me see it? I want to know for sure I can go to heaven. Is that you? Is that you? All right, let's pray. Just a minute now. The piano is going to play. When it does, you stand. Head bowed and eyes closed. Those of you with things in your life, personal things, you need to say goodbye and not look back on. The Holy Spirit spoke to you today. You need to come forward and get it settled. You need to come forward and say, Holy Spirit, with your help, oh God, with your help, I'm going to say goodbye on a divorce. I'm going to say goodbye on a financial failure. I'm going to say goodbye on personal problems. I'm going to say goodbye on heartache and disappointment or heartbreak and the death of a loved one. I'm going to say goodbye on all this disappointment I've had in people. 
and I'm not going to look back, and I'm going to go forward from this day. This one thing I do, Paul said, forgetting those things which are past and pressing on things which are before. If that's you, you need to come forward and deal with it at the altar. Miss Alana, you play. Everyone standing, head bowed, eyes closed. The altar's yours. Now you use it. You use it. That's right. That's right. Head bowed, eyes closed. That's right. That's good. You come forward as far as you can. Whatever it is you need to deal with, whatever it is the Lord spoke with you, you say, Preacher, the Lord dealt with me. I didn't come, though. The Lord dealt with me. The Holy Spirit told me there's something I need to deal with, something I need to settle. Preacher, pray for me. Is that you? Would you slip your hand up? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I see that hand. Yes, sir. You come. You come. Come on, folks. It's an old-fashioned Baptist church. Some of you guys didn't raise your hand. You said, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I'm not 100% sure. Folks, I can tell you, until I was 22 years old, I had no idea what, I was, what would happen to me when I died. In fact, I knew what would happen to me. I'd go straight to hell. But because Jesus never gave up on me and died for me, I realized that. I knew for sure I could go to heaven. Wouldn't you like to know for sure you'd go to heaven? Wouldn't that be a great thing? And wouldn't that be a great thing if you could know for sure you're going to heaven? Nobody looking around. Nobody looking around. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody looking around but me and you. Nobody looking around but, but you and me. You say, I didn't even raise my hand. I sure didn't come forward. But if you'll look up and catch my eye right now, I'll catch your eye. You say, Brother Jackson, pray for me, man. Pray for me. That, that's a good thing. I want to know for sure I'm going to heaven. I'd sure hate to die and face the alternative. And that's you. And you just look up and catch my eye. Don't be timid. Don't be intimidated. Don't be shy. Don't hold back. The thing telling you to hold back is Satan. The thing telling you to look up is the Holy Ghost of God. Is that you? Anyone else? All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. And I'll have you be seated. Father, we love you.